Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from 1 John. It's not the same as the Gospel of John. 1 John is a little bitty book in the back of the Bible. If you start from the back and go toward the front, you'll get there quicker. It's 1 John. I'm going to start with chapter 1, verse 1, and read through chapter 2, verse 3. And this is what it says. We write you now about what has always existed, which we have heard, we have seen with our own eyes, we have looked at, and we have touched with our hands. We write to you about the Word that gives life. He who gives life was shown to us. We saw him and can give proof about it. And now we announce to you that he has life that continues forever. He was with God the Father and was shown to us. We announce to you what we have seen and heard because we want you also to have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with God the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. We write this to you so you can be full of joy with us. Here is the message which we have heard from Christ and now announce to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So if we say we have fellowship with God but we continue living in darkness, we are liars and do not follow the truth. But if we live in the light, as God is in the light, we can share fellowship with each other. Then the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from every sin. If we say we have no sin, we are fooling ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He will forgive our sins because we can trust God to do what is right. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs we have done. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and we do not accept God's teaching. My dear children, I write this letter to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have a helper in the presence of the Father, Jesus Christ, the one who does what is right. He is the way our sins are taken away, and not only our sins, but the sins of all people. We can be sure that we know God if we obey his commands. Pray with me. Jesus, we need this day, a time with you, a time with one another, a time that we might open the eyes of our hearts, the ears of our hearts, and be changed by you. Thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. In 1947, Vladimir Zimchenkov returned from a night of drinking. It was post-World War II Russia, and when he got home, he realized he had misplaced 400 ration cards that belonged to his boss. He looked everywhere for them. He couldn't find them. He was certain that if they didn't execute him, they would at least send him to Siberia to be in prison. So he and his wife hatched a plan. She would tell all the neighbors, everyone who asked, that that Vladimir, her husband, had run off with another woman. And Vladimir was going to hide in the house. And that's what he did. He hid. For 22 years, Vladimir Zinchinkov didn't come out of his house. It wasn't until his wife died in 1969 that Vladimir came out for the first time. 
He went to the police station and he said, I'm the one you've been looking for. I'm the one with the 400 ration cards. That's when the police said, oh, those cards, we found those, they were in your desk. <laughs> he had been hiding for 22 years. He'd been hiding in the shadows of his own home for 22 years because of fear, because of fear, because of fear of what would happen. Fear does that to people. It pushes us to the shadows. It, it causes us to, to hide. It sucks the life right out of us. John is writing to a church that was riddled with fear. It wasn't just one church. It, it was the churches all over Asia Minor, Greece. He's writing a letter because there was a heresy, a false teaching that was going out there among the churches and, and many were picking up on it. And it was this false teaching that tried to separate people from us and them. And in this heresy, in this false teaching, the us people were the, the people that were spiritual. The them people were the non-spiritual people. And there was this idea, this idea that the, the us people, the really spiritual people, that we lived a spiritual life. And we had a special knowledge. A special knowledge that came directly from God and, and that the people that, that weren't spiritual people, well, they lived a life where they had bodies that decay and ache and pain. And, and it, they lived a life of, 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 of the hard things, of the tangible things, of things that fell apart, had aches and pains. And the spiritual people, well, they didn't have to live that kind of life that was concerned with the body. They could treat their bodies like a playground. They could treat their bodies like a, a demolition ground. They could do anything they wanted to with their bodies because bodies didn't matter at all. And they taught that Jesus didn't have a body. And that Jesus was spiritual like they are. And really the true mark of a Christian was contempt for them. Those who, who lived in the, the everyday and the, the, the riffraff there was an us and there were them. The non-spiritual people, that, that was the them. And they lived in contempt. Well, people in the churches were trying hard to hide in the shadows. They feared contempt of others. And so John is writing to these churches what he's seen, what he's heard, what he's touched is the word that he's used. And that what he's seen, what he's heard, what he's touched, it's Jesus. That he's been with Jesus. And he wants folks to know that this whole contempt thing, cut it out. That contempt is, it's not a kingdom value. In chapter 4 he goes on to say that if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. That it's not separating sheep from goats. It's not separating us and them. It's contempt is not a kingdom value. And then he goes in verse 4. He says, we write this to you so you can be full of joy with us. Not hiding in the shadows. Not practicing contempt. Not being in fear of contempt. But full of joy. Full of joy. And joy, it's not just an attitude. It's not just an, an ideal. That it's a practice. It's a practice. And here John tells that early church, and, and this church too, what the practice of joy includes. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Practice. The practice of fellowship. 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. This is what it says. Is we announce to you what we have seen and heard because we want you to also to have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with God the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to you so you can be full of joy with us. It's fellowship. Fellowship, fellowship is, a, is a word we don't use very often these days outside of church. But it is a part of of an ancient practice that we practice today. 
An example of it is you know, people for centuries shake hands in the West. They shake hands. And really what it is, it's a practice of showing not only that there's no weapon in your hand, but you take one step more and connect to the other person with the shaking of hands. We stopped that for a little while during the pandemic, and, and I think we lost a little something there. I think folks have started it back up, but it's that in the church, it used to be called the right hand of fellowship. I haven't heard it called that in a long time. But if there are two words in Greek that, that we ought to know, one word we ought to know is the Greek word baklava. It's a, it's a, a Greek dessert. It means delicious goodness, and that's exactly what it is. Everybody ought to know what baklava is. The other word is this word for fellowship. In Greek, it's koinonia. Koinonia. And it means more than just shaking hands. It's a coming together. It's what John is talking about here. It's a coming together, yes, with God. Fellowship with God. It's important. But so often folks think that's where it stops. That me and God have a good thing going so everybody else can go pound sand. Well, that's not what it says right here. It's also a fellowship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, where two or more gathered in my name, I'm in their midst. So, it's a fellowship, yes, with God, yes, with Christ, and yes, with others. That it's a connection where he joins our spirit with his spirit. And there's something that happens when we come together as Christians. Comes together in worship. Comes together in Sunday school and small groups. Comes together in, in a meal. Comes together on our commons. We're preparing a place where we can come together with other Christians. Come together with the community where we can share with one another. And truly be a place of community and faith. A fellowship. Where we connect to God and one another. In World War II, Japan. The Japanese were, were trying to figure out ways to extract information from prisoners. They were doing research on this and soon discovered the best way they could extract information from prisoners was to put prisoners in isolation. Because it's in isolation that people grow weak from temptation. Grow weak and discouraged. Grow weak and fearful. Scripture points not to temptation, not to discouragement, and not to fear. Scripture points to Jesus Christ that we might practice the joy of fellowship. The coming together. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see the day drawing near. Encouraging, building up, coming together. It brings joy. It brings joy. The joy of fellowship. But the fullness of joy, John didn't stop there. He also said the fullness of joy is in forgiveness. It's not an ideal. It's not an idea. It's a practice. The practice of the joy of forgiveness. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. This is what it says. It says, if we say we have no sin, we're fooling ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he will forgive us our sins because we can trust God, to do what is right. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs we have done. Several years ago, a friend invited me to go to a lecture with him to hear Rabbi Harold Kushner. I don't know if you remember, he wrote the, the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Several other good books, too. Well, this night, he wasn't talking about that particular book. What he was talking about was research he had done on an upcoming book. And what he said was his research, he learned that every tribe, every culture, every nation, that when people come together, one of the things that naturally happens is, is they develop a code, a code that they can separate themselves from each other. 
that they can divide us and them, they can divide the good and the bad. And it doesn't make any difference what the culture, what the tribe, what the nation is, that they d develop a code. That we find it in our language, that there's honor among thieves. That even among thieves, that thieves, they can steal all they want to, but the one thing a thief cannot do is steal from another thief. Everybody else is fair game, but that's who the bad thieves are. The good thieves are the one who steal from others. The bad thieves are the one that steal from other thieves. He went on to say that in prison, that, that there's a prison culture. That you can rape, pillage, plunder, kill, murder. You can do whatever you want. There's just one thing you don't do. You don't hurt a child. Those are the bad people. Those are the ones that are the them. Those are the ones with a worse record. And he went on to say that every tribe, every culture, every nation... When people come together, that's what's most natural for them. I remember when I was a kid, I tried very hard to be good. And I want to go ahead and tell you, I had limited success. So what I did was I tried harder. And the older I got, the harder I tried. And what happened was I had even more limited success. And not only did I not have success, I got discouraged so I decided, yeah, something needs to change. So what I changed is rather than trying to be good, I would look at those with a worse record than what I had. And as long as I could compare myself to somebody else, I mean, there was always somebody worse than I was. And I think the first time that I realized what I was doing, as I was talking to a friend, it was a friend who, who, well, he started taking drugs. And when he started taking drugs, he said, well, yeah, well, I... I, I take drugs, but, you know, I don't sell drugs. Excuse me, he said, I take drugs, but I don't buy drugs. Well, then he started buying drugs. And then when he started buying drugs, he said, well, yeah, I take drugs, I buy drugs, but I, I don't sell drugs. And then he started selling drugs. There was always somebody worse than he was where he could feel okay about himself. And the word contempt comes to mind. That as long as there's someone out there that we can have contempt for, we can feel pretty good about ourselves. This is what John was battling. Life in Jesus Christ begins when the excuses stop. And the excuses stop at the cross. At the cross, we don't offer our excuses at the cross, we offer our confession. And John tells us right here what we receive is forgiveness. Forgiveness. That John is writing about a joy received when we put our excuses down. A joy that's received when we turn to Christ. And what he did on the cross. And not to our own strength. Not to our own abilities. And certainly not to our own contempt. That we turn to Jesus Christ. There's joy in it. There's joy in the practice of turning to Christ. There's joy in it. In laying down our excuses. And turning to the cross of Jesus Christ. John is writing to a church. He's writing to you and to me. That we might know the joy of fellowship. That we might know the joy of forgiveness. And the last thing that I want to talk about. That we might know the joy of obedience. 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. This is what John says. My dear children... I write this letter to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have a helper in the presence of the Father, Jesus Christ, the one who does what is right. He is the way our sins are taken away. And not only our sins, but the sins of all people. We can be sure that we know God if we obey His commands. That obedience, obedience, obedience is what's expected. Now, if you're reading along in your Bible, verse 2 
there's a word that it's probable that your translation came across. This morning I'm using the New Century Version because it doesn't use that, that word because a lot of folks for a long time have tripped over that word. Propitiation is what may have been there. And that word propitiation is a word that we never use. I've never heard ever anyone use the word propitiation in a sentence in the everyday, in the ordinary. The word propitiation here literally refers to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And it was there in the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, where it was in the Ark that the, the glory of God resided, and the lid was that, that thin, tangible lid, the place you could touch, the place you could feel. That was the place where sins were forgiven. The place where heaven touched earth is what the lid of the Ark of the Covenant was. And that was where Jesus' seat was. Where Jesus forgives our sins. And not only that, that's the place where heaven touches earth, where Jesus meets you and me. To give power, power that we don't have. And gives us a new heart. A cleansed heart. A heart. That has his spirit. Helping us. All day, every day. William Temple writes about this when he says, It's no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it, but I can't. And it's no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that. Jesus could do it, but I can't. But if the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me, then I could write plays like that. And if the spirit of Jesus could come and live in me, then I could live a life like that. I have good news for you. Not only can the spirit of Jesus, the helper, come and live, he will. He will come and live and give you a heart like that, a life like that. A life that has strength and power that we don't have. A strength and a power to obey when we don't have strength and power to do that. There's joy. There's joy in obedience. Not in contempt. Not in pride. Not in our power. But in His. This is available to you today. It may be that you've never asked and you've not known that joy because you've been, well, you've been trying harder and harder and what you've been having is more and more discouragement. Or it may be that um, you've not known the joy of forgiveness. Instead, what you've known is the joy of, not joy at all, the misery of pointing to somebody with a worse record. And it's not led you to life, it sucked the life right out of you. Or it may be that you've been afraid. You've been pushing away from fellowship with God and fellowship with others. And this day, you sense that God's given you a nudge. Well, I want to pray with you. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, this day, we know that there are all kinds of isolation calls us to not share with you, not to open up with others. It's a fear that calls us to the places where we hide from you and hide from others. It calls us to the shadows. It doesn't call us to joy. It calls us it calls us to a place where there's darkness, misery, where there's death. Bring us to the joy of fellowship with you, Lord, this day. And not by our power, but by yours. Where we practice. Practice sharing with other Christians. The joy Lord, we receive in fellowship with you 
may we practice asking for forgiveness there at the foot of the cross where life begins a life where we stop making the excuses and instead offer to you confession Lord it may be that there are folks this morning that have been trying real hard for a long time to be obedient but they've grown discouraged because they've had limited success. Anyone who's tried really hard to be good knows that limited success. And it may be that um, there are folks that have, have tried to, to remedy that by pointing to others with a worse record. Lord, joy doesn't come and those who have a worse record, you know, and you tell us plainly. Joy, it comes from you, a new heart, a new creation, a clean heart inside of us. And this day we ask for that clean heart, that new heart that has your help, your help giving strength we don't have. Breathe that power on us this day and in the days to come. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.